Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. And welcome to the Supreme Leader uh, A Push Review. That's right. That's what we're doing. I tell you what, it's been a rough week. And shout out to my friends at Arkansas High School, uh, same mascot as the university and all that. Now, I thought that this was put in an oven. Uh, you know, Maddie's name's kind of starting to come off here. These mugs tend to do that. But uh, my number one fans over there at Arkansas High School. Whoa, whoa, there are a lot of people watching. All right, we got over a thousand people in here. Tell your friends, ladies and gentlemen. All right, so I'm going to be taking questions via Twitter. And the questions coming in via Twitter, priority is going to go to people who are following me at Tom Ritchie, of course. You know, if you're asking a question, you should be following the person. Um, and then with the Supreme Leader hashtag. OK, so ask your question via Twitter. Uh, if you're following me, you got the Supreme Leader hashtag on there. Let people know what's going on here and at me. So at me, you know, follow me at me with a question and Supreme Leader hashtag. Now I'm going to warn you, there are like one or two nights a year on Twitter where I can't keep up with everything. I may or may not see what you tweet. Uh, I'm not intentionally ignoring you or anything like that, but the hashtag for this is Supreme Leader. And I tell you what, uh, I'm thinking, I was, I was thinking about, okay, so on your AP exam, there are times, you know, the AP readers can't read something if it's got a line crossed through it, okay? And what I was thinking about getting every to put everybody to put, and I still may do this for your row is write dragon energy on your dbq or leq and just put a line through it but what i'm thinking would be really funny okay because hip hughes was supposed to be here with me tonight and then he had to back out and then i was like well you know what who am i going to invite and then i saw that uh, kim jong-un comes up on my news feed and i was like let's invite kim jong-un well he didn't come either so i guess i'm gonna have to be the supreme leader of a push for tonight but the thing is what i think it'd be funny is if you're referring to somebody who's the president or anything like that like the president or senator or congressman uh just write supreme leader and then cross it out and then just keep writing your essay i think it'd be really funny if like the ap readers they see something recurring there were years ago people wrote this is sparta um and the readers thought it was really funny so what i'm thinking would be really funny is somewhere in your essay you know just like andrew jackson so president andrew jackson killed the bank or you're like president and then you know supreme leader line through it and then keep going with your essay anyway i think it'd be funny now let me go ahead and let me show you about all of the opportunities we've got for tonight. First of all, first things first, ladies and gentlemen, while y'all are here, most important thing for tonight, buy my app. $2.99 at the App Store. It's called Romulus A Push Review. Nice little handy app, just a trivia app, just asking you some rapid fire questions. It's available in the App Store and Google Play. Also, if you go to tomritchie.net slash A Push, you may already be there. Uh, but what I'm doing here, I'm doing this from 8 o'clock to 9 30. And then at 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Now, if you're on the East Coast, don't do this, okay? Um, I'm having a fireside chat cram session. Now, I'm limiting this to 30 participants, okay? This is basically going to be me and a class size group of people, okay? That's going to be all that we've got there, okay? So it's gonna be a very, very small group of people and only 30 participants. If you're on the East Coast, go to bed, but if you're on in another time zone, you might wanna think about that, okay? And so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, just wanted to uh, share that with you. And let's go ahead and go to Twitter and figure out uh, what people wanna talk about tonight. All right, we've got a meme here. I love when people are tweeting memes. All right, so Alyssa just tweeted me a meme. I'm gonna retweet that meme. Uh, you know, immigrants threatening your way of life. That must be tough. Okay, so let's see what we've got coming in here. All right, so uh, all right, Stephania, Stefania, it's a written test, right? Okay, you're a pretty okay person. I think you're an awesome person, okay? So uh, using the Supreme Leader hashtag, the DBQ formula. Now, um, Stefania, I'm going to say that I've got a DBQ video on YouTube that is absolutely free, okay? A DBQ video on YouTube, absolutely free. If you just go ahead and go to YouTube and you put a push DBQ, okay? Now, if you're just like in a situation where you're like, oh, Oh my goodness um i don't uh i don't have any idea what i'm doing here um and you know i still don't know how to write a dbq i don't know how to set it up now there is the free video here okay there is the free video you go to the a push dbq and that's a three-part video now that is absolutely free now another thing you could go to tomritchie.net 
and riding dash clinic. Okay. So you could go to riding clinic, which is actually, yeah. So you go to, or you can go to online store riding clinic. Uh, now the thing is, this is a $27 product. You can use the promo code eight clinic 10 to get it for $17. If you're just, now the thing is, if you already know how to ride a DBQ and LAQ, you know, don't worry about that. But that is eight clinic 10 is the uh is the code here if you want to get a subscription for that and i'll go ahead and i will tweet that okay so ten dollars off eight month riding clinic with eight clinic 10 coupon code okay so that is a link to that and that is a push supreme leader okay Supreme Leader Hangout. Okay, so you can get if you're, you know, try if you're still wondering about that. But thank you, Stefania, for supporting my work. Now, remember, there is a free video there on YouTube. I just wanted to say, since it's the night before the exam, I thought that I might as well just put that out there. If you want to get a hold of that, ten dollars off, no problem. Okay, if you're just wanting to look at some of that and figure out how to set up a DBQ for some of you who've been preparing by yourself. Okay, so that is out there for you. Um, let's see. AP exam doesn't feel so good. Please help. Let's see what we can do here. All right. So remember beliefs in the re in the religions of the colonies where they lived. Okay. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the colonies. Okay. So let me go ahead and pull up something here where we will go ahead and go into uh, colonial America and go from there. All right. So let's go ahead and let's see, I need to go to review and I'm going to, I've got something here that I'm going to share with y'all. Okay. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about colonial America. And first of all, all right. So let me give you kind of a quick, like, you know, so we'll go ahead and go through the colonial period. Oh, and it looks like, okay, so I'm already sharing my screen here. All right. So as far as that goes, Native American cultures, I've got a blog post on my website here. Now, one thing we want to know, there are a few things we want to know about Native Americans. Okay. But you can look that up, Native American cultures. I've got a video. Remember at any point, if you want to get more into something, go look for a video. I've also got a uh, I've got my videos. Daniel Joe's has great videos. Mr. Betts class, if you want a little brain break, uh, Hip Hughes has videos. Now, remember that Native Americans practiced agriculture. It wasn't just all hunting and gathering. Also, when you look at this map here, there are several tribal groups. OK, so you want to know that there was diversity among the Native Americans um, and also that they practiced agriculture. OK, I've got a little organizer here with just the key things here, and this is in the video as well. All right. So, you know, for example, now the Plains Indians, one thing we want to note there is the Plains Indians, uh, they rode horses. These horses were introduced from Europe. This was part of the Columbian Exchange. The Columbian Exchange is the one thing that you need to know for a push, AP Euro and AP World. Okay. But the Plains Indians using horses, that is a direct uh, result of the Columbian Exchange. Um, then we've got the, you know, Indian agriculture here, the three sisters, squash, corn, and beans, and typically planted together, not, uh, you know, planting these neat rows like European agriculture. Uh, sometimes I've seen questions about uh, gender roles, you know, that uh, the Indians had, you know, different roles for men and women. Oftentimes, the men would be more likely to hunt and, you know, women were, you know, in charge of the farming, whereas in these European cultures, uh, you know, the men tended to do a lot of the farming and raising livestock. Uh, you know, Native Americans didn't tend to raise livestock. Uh, there was intertribal warfare. These tribes had different languages. They fought each other. Europeans fought each other. And also Europeans got involved in these rivalries between their allied tribes. OK, so we want to note here that these Indians had diverse and conflicting cultures and also diverse interactions with their environment, which included agriculture. All right. So speaking of the Colombian exchange, remember, you've got some things coming from Europe um, that you've got, uh, you know, of course, diseases, livestock, uh, you know, a lot of different things like, you know, sugar and bananas and peaches that ended up growing really well in the new world. Um, but they came from the old world. And then, of course, uh, you know, from the new world to the old, I mean, from the, yeah, the new world back to the old world, you've got, you uh, you know, things like tobacco, okay, which tobacco 
turkeys, squash, you know, some things. And this is the beginning of that, it, at that trade relationship where you see that Atlantic trade. OK, so crops, animals, diseases and the like. Now, you want to uh, maybe just spend a few minutes looking at European colonizers and thinking about, OK, Spanish, French, Dutch, English. What do they have in common? And be ready to make some comparisons. So, for example, the Spanish and the French were both Catholic, the Dutch and the English being Protestant. Uh, the Dutch and the French both have the fur trade here. Now, the English, one thing about the English is that they're practicing agriculture and notice that they're also sending many colonists, okay? And so, as far as that goes, now, the other thing is not only there's the Spanish and the French Catholic, but they also have organized programs of evangelism. Now, that's not to say that there were no Dutch or English uh, missionaries, but that the Spanish and the French were very deliberately uh, doing this. Now, I often think of Native American policies, you know, the way that these uh, colonizers interacted with the natives. I think about General Patton, lead me, follow me, or get out of my way. Whereas the Spanish want to be followed, okay? Um, then the French and the Dutch, they're, you know, having exchanges, all right? They're having exchanges. And so, you know, they're based on the fur trade. So it's not a dominance thing. It's really an association of equals. And so it'd be lead me. Now, the English having many more colonists, it is get out of my way. All right. That's what they're trying to do there. All right. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, now, if we had an LEQ prompt, remember that there are three types of LEQ prompt, causation, comparison, and continuity and change over time. So let's say that you had an LEQ prompt, like evaluate the extent to which the Spanish and the French colonists were different from each other. Uh, you would, the way that I like to set up LEQs is to set up these boxes here, okay, where you've got it set up to where I think pre writing is very, very important because you're writing timed essays, ladies and gentlemen. And so on one hand, you've got unique to the Spanish. On another hand, unique to the French. And then if you want to get the complex understanding, you want to look at what both have in common. Now, if you want to review the rubric, just type in a push LEQ rubric. And you will find here the second link here um, is my rubric, OK, uh, which uh, thank you to all the teachers who use my rubric. I'm very uh, you know, flattered and appreciate appreciative that y'all do this and y'all have gotten this such a high Google ranking. But remember, six points in the first paragraph. Now, contextualization doesn't have to be in the first paragraph, but that's where your readers looking for it. Typically, it's kind of like, you know, you are setting the stage and providing useful background with some details as well. And so then your thesis. Now, evidence, there are two levels of evidence here, okay? And then finally, your analysis and reasoning. Now, the complex understanding point for the LEQ, notice where it says explaining both similarity and difference, both continuity and change, or multiple causes or both causes and effects. And so if we want to set this up, we want to make sure that uh, we've got, you know, some things that are in common as well. So, excuse me, what I would note here, is that the Spanish were conquering. Um, you had the Spanish conquistadors, missions, encomienda. I might mention, you know, sometimes mentioning names is good. Now, if you were doing this on your exam, you could say Supreme Leader Bartolome de las Casas and just cross out Supreme Leader. It's just kind of a joke. It'll probably, it'll make the reader laugh. I think that it would be great to have just this kind of inside joke of our community that's preparing for this exam. Um, so, you know, that would be, that, that I would find that, I would find that funny. If you find it funny too, think about doing it. I think it'd be fun to get a little thing going. Um, the French, they're friendly with the Indians, the fur trade, okay? The Jesuits tended to live among the natives and learned the languages of the natives. They had a friendly relationship. That is why, you know, during the French and Indian War, the majority of these Indians sided with the French, you know, and not the British because the French were friendly and less threatening friendly French. That's a good way to remember that. Now, both of them were Catholic and they had programs to evangelize Indians. Both of them sent few colonists. OK, and that would help me out as far as putting a thesis together. OK, so I could go into something like this. I could say, although the Spanish and French were both Catholic and evangelized Indians, the Spanish sought to make money from Indian treasure and labor, while the French had friendlier relations because of the fur trade. French, friendly, 
fur trait. I almost sound like Dwight Schrute, you know, uh, Beats, Bears, Battlestar, Galactica. Uh, Fatima, Fatima, if you're watching, shout out to all you and all of the other great A-Push students in San Diego. Uh, so great to uh, to have your support and all of that, uh, all of that good stuff. Thank you so much. All right. So as far as that goes, then we want to look at the 13 colonies. Okay. So as far as that goes, you know, you think about when you're thinking about the 13 colonies, um, you know, come up with, don't try to remember all the colonies. Don't try to remember every person. Remember kind of like a representative person or a few representative people. And so the key colonies here, uh, you know, in New England being Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Okay. Um, and then New York and Pennsylvania, the middle colonies, Southern colonies, Virginia and Carolina. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as that goes, all right. And Fatima knew, uh, Fatima, you already know. All right. So, uh, excellent, excellent. So good to see you studying there. And so then you want to think about the economy. Now the middle colonies and the Southern colonies are about agriculture. Now, the other thing here is you want to make sure that you get the difference between staple crops and cash crops. Okay. So staple crops and cash crops, wheat and corn versus tobacco, rice, and indigo. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that is concerned, now New England is much more focused on commerce, okay, and trade. All right, excellent. You know, we've got, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Snapchat, Tom Ritchie SC. Now, of course, uh, I'm having problems with my phone, my home button, uh, which I'm having to use that little temporary home button. And I'm just, this happened just a second ago. Um, so anyway, let's see. Okay, two. Uh, no, I'm not going to be able to do that one. All right. So as far as that goes, staple crops, cash crops. Now, remember, during the colonial period, you couldn't, uh, you know, you couldn't grow cotton. You couldn't raise cotton because it was too labor intensive of a crop, you know, before the cotton gin. And so on the multiple choice, especially, they'll try to throw some out of period stuff at you. So if you've got something on colonial America, don't get into, you know, they might have a distractor about cotton agriculture. And you know, so then the predominant religions, okay, so Puritan, Separatists, the Congregational Church, of course, the Baptists in Rhode Island. Now, I typically think about New England as fanatical, uh, the middle colonies as tolerant, because that's where you've got the uh, the Quakers. And remember, also Quaker oats, okay, Quaker oats, that's uh, staple crops, wheat and corn. And the South had a casual attitude about religion, at least until the Great Awakenings, okay? And uh, let me give a little uh, little shout out. There was somebody who sent me something on Instagram. Okay, wow, we've got uh, over 3,000 in here. Tell your friends that we're here, ladies and gentlemen. We are uh, so glad that everybody's, uh, that everybody's here. Um, and come on now, come on now. All right, so as far as that goes, um, there was somebody who sent me something on Instagram. She actually went through the trouble of writing on a uh, writing on a marker board here. Okay, just wrote it on a marker board. And so, you know, I might need to uh, I might need to find you know to actually give them a little shout out here and answer the question here about the uh, about the Great Awakenings. Okay, and so let's see. So, Aaron, uh, you and your friends wanted to know about about the Great Awakenings, okay? So the significant, so we when we look at the first and second Great Awakening. Now, one thing here, you wanna note what they have in common, okay? So if we're gonna make our boxes, okay? So you would have first, so if we're gonna compare the first and second Great Awakening, and we have our little boxes for the first Great Awakening and the second Great Awakening, and then we ha have what they have in common. Now, they are both emotional revivals, okay? They're both religious revivals, and they appeal to emotion, and the hellfire and bring stone preaching. Okay. So they all have that in common. Now, the thing is that we want to keep in mind that the second great awakening was particularly uh, different in the sense that there was social reform that resulted in uh, the second great awakening. Like the second great awakening really, uh, you know, spawned uh, temperance and abolitionism spawn these antebellum reform movements. Okay. And thank you so much, Jenny. If I end up uh, flagging and needing a little bit, bit of relief, I uh, appreciate all the A push teachers that have reached out to me and offered to help. Uh, right now, I'm going kind of full steam. So we'll see. I've actually got some tea in here. And uh, again, my friends at uh, Arkansas High School, if any of y'all are watching, 
is Amy Claire watching? I need to find out. So, uh, so anyway, yeah. So they, uh, they claim they are my biggest fans and, uh, her name hadn't faded like hers, but anyway, so, um, you know, the first great awakening, Jonathan Edwards, George, uh, you know, George Whitfield or Whitefield is a written test and they both, you know, the, the preaching, the emotional preaching. Now, um, the first great awakening, Calvinism. Okay. So you still have this kind of Calvinist mindset. When you think about sinners in the hands of an angry God, it's like, it's not like, I mean, you're going to hell. Okay. But there's probably nothing you could do about it anyway, but you should like be fearful of God because God decides whether you're going to heaven or hell, like sinners in the hands of an angry God, you're hanging by a thread and he's going to do what he wants to do with you. There's not really a decision. The second great awakening is much more about a decision that you have free will. It's not based on Calvinism. Okay. It's not based on Calvinism and the sovereignty of God, but more you have a decision to make. Now, another thing about both great awakenings is that you have, a decline in traditional denominations and a rise in evangelical denominations such as Baptist and Methodist, okay? Which where I live in the South, like the legacy of the Second Great Awakening is still very strong, you know, with uh, evangelical religions, okay? So as far as that goes, remember Jonathan Edwards, George Whitefield over here, Calvinism, okay? And then you've got this idea of like free will and spawning social reform, okay? So so basically, the second great awakening, you get to decide whether you're a decent person or not. And if you think about it, the abolitionists, uh, you know, they are driven by morality. If you read William Lloyd Garrison and The Liberator. Now, remember, when you think about abolitionism, bring up a prominent abolitionist and go into something they did. So my abolition box, when I think about a box, like it's a mental box where I've got all my abolitionism stuff. So, you know, I would think about William Lloyd Garrison, publisher of The Liberator. And it's very, very, you know, he's a very religious man. He's being motivated, you know, that a lot of people say, well, slavery is just a part of our economy and part of, you know, with that we don't need, you know, part of our society. And William Lloyd Garrison was convinced it was wrong and, you know, gave a very impractical solution. Don't get rid of it gradually, get rid of it everywhere and get rid of it now. Okay. And the thing is, William Lloyd Garrison, it's like, well, what he wanted to do would, you know, really uh, shake up society. But William Lloyd Garrison's thinking, you know what? If we're doing something that's unjust and against what God wants, then why does it matter whether it's going to shake up society? What needs to matter is the right thing. OK, so when you get into the higher law doctrine, you know, well, slavery is protected by the Constitution before the 13th Amendment. Well, the high there is a higher law than the Constitution. Uh, so said William Seward. And so, you know, remember that the abolitionists and the temperance movement, um, this was very much motivated, uh, you know, by religion and by the Second Great Awakening. Awakening. So you've got this uh, this pursuit of social reform following that. OK. And so as far as that, Aaron, uh, good, very good luck to you on your exam. OK. Um, so as far as that goes. All right. So then. We get into, whoa, we've got some uh, some notifications here. I right now remember there's a lot going on on Twitter. All right. Chloe. All right, Chloe, who Chloe, you have been great to me these past couple of weeks. Uh, you know, did the uh, the multiple choice hangout. And that was, uh, you know, that was awesome. Thanks for doing the multiple choice webinar and being in the BRI webinars. Um, what was Jay's treaty and how did how did it lead to the quasi war? OK, now Jay's treaty was a treaty with Britain and it was very unpopular, like in the Treaty of Paris, 1783. Now, remember, 1763, uh, you know, this was something that ended the French and Indian War, 1783. Easy to remember because 20 years apart exactly. So the Treaty of Paris, 1783, the British were supposed to have vacated um, some forts and they didn't. And Jay's treaty basically, like the British, from my understanding of this, they agreed to do some things that they were already supposed to have done. And in return, we gave them most favored nation status. Now, remember that this was a country, you know, the United States was a country that just had fought a war with the British. Britain was the enemy, especially to the Jeffersonians. Okay. And so as far as, uh, as far as that, especially the Jeffersonians. Um, and so remember though, Hamilton's party, the Federalists, they were Anglophiles. They were admirers of Britain and the British system. And so really what you're, what you're dealing with here is that the Federalists, Jay's treaty was a foreign policy victory for the Federalists because it, 
improved relationships with Britain and maintain Britain as the number one trading partner of the United States. And of course, France with the citizen Ganae incident and all of that kind of stuff, France is being, you know, alienated and you start to see the Federalists, uh, you know, giving France a cold shoulder. Uh, James Monroe, who was the ambassador, was yanked back because the Washington administration, they saw him as being too pro-French. Okay. So that's what's going on that the French, you know, expected us to support them because they'd supported us. Washington's like, no neutrality. And remember that when you think about perspective and point of view, um, you know, that Jefferson as secretary of state didn't support Washington's neutrality policy. But once Jefferson uh, took over as president, he did support Washington's neutrality policy. All right. I tell you what, 3,600 people in here, it's still growing. Tell your friends that we're here and uh, we are going to summon some dragon energy. And remember on your test tomorrow, Supreme Leader, if you want to have a good time on your DBQ or an LEQ somewhere, just mark a line through it. Supreme leader. All right. And use it to refer to somebody. Let's see. And a quick shout out to my friend, JC, John Coleman Ward, and whoever Pearson is, let's give them a quick shout out. All right. So as far as this, uh, Nolan, you're asking about, uh, you know, about the successes of the populist party. Okay. Now, the Populist Party was a was a third party movement in the 1890s. All right. Now, remember that the United States had been for a long time a nation of farmers. And what was going on in the late 19th century was the rise of industrial America. And so you've got the monopolists who are getting a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of clout in the government. Then the labor unions are organizing. Now, the thing is, although farmers were no longer a majority, there were still more farmers than anyone else. And so the populist party represented the, the farmers who were getting together here. Now, as far as that goes, let me go ahead and share my screen with you. And let's go ahead and take a quick look at this here. Now, Farmers uniting. Now, I've got three different uh, things here that you've got on a social level. You've got the Grange, okay? The Grange was really kind of how this started. This was a social club for farmers that started to lean toward, uh, you know, political. And then the Farmers Alliances. And then finally, the Populist Party, okay? So the Populist Party. Now, um, as far as that goes, the farmers tried, you know, economic cooperatives where they could buy and sell things and that sort of thing. Now, the populist party, they could buy and sell things together in bulk. So the populist party or the people's party, this was Southern and Western farmers and was a third party. Now the populist platform had a couple of different uh, sides. First of all, the political reform proposals and second of all, the economic reform proposals. Now they wanted direct election of senators. They wanted ballot initiatives. Now ballot initiatives, this is where the voters can take the initiative. They don't have to wait for the legislature that voters can gather signatures and put something on the ballot through direct democracy, uh, which is how, you know, the states who have recently approved recreational use of marijuana. This doesn't tend to go through the state legislatures. This tends to be a ballot initiative. Um, and then they wanted a secret ballot. Now, the thing is, as far as this goes, uh, now there are ballot initiatives in some states, but not others. My state of South Carolina does not have ballot initiatives, but some states do. Uh, direct election of senators now was achieved through the 17th Amendment. Now, what I want to note here is that the populists were defeated. Uh, you know, they didn't really get that many popular or electoral votes. Now, they did score some electoral votes, uh, but they, you know, electorally, they were never successful. But a lot of their proposals were taken up by the progressives. Now, the populists tended to be rural farmers where the progressives were, um, you know, urban middle class people. But, you know, it ended up that a lot of these things these farmers were advocating for that urban middle class progressives thought, you know, these things are good. OK. And then they wanted a graduated income tax, which, of course, that's the 16th Amendment. So the income tax being the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment being the direct election of senators and 
then now bimetallism, which was challenging the gold standard, unlimited coinage of silver. Now, the populists had a very radical campaign platform. They wanted the railroads to be nationalized. They wanted the government to own and operate the railroads. Now, that never happened, um, but the Interstate Commerce Commission was put together in order to regulate the railroads. So the government wouldn't operate the railroads, but uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission does so show some success here in at least moving toward a regulation of the railroads. Now, a lot of times I ask students, you know, is this a Jeffersonian movement? Uh, not so much, even though it's farmers. Now, remember, Jefferson was more of a laissez-faire guy. And so, you know, high taxes, Jefferson probably wouldn't have been too crazy about that. And the nationalization of the railroads, I don't think he would have wanted the government operating the railroads. So that's a little bit about uh, the populist uh, platform. And remember, ladies and gentlemen, the Romulus APUS History Review app is a handy little thing for your phone, only $2.99. And you can get, you know, while you're waiting to take your exam, you're waiting in line there at the location, you can get on there. It'll give you some handy little quiz reviews. And and, you know, just give it some thought. If this is helping you, uh, I'd love for you to buy my app. If you don't, you know, I mean, if you don't want to, that's up to you too. All right. So uh, we are, gosh, I'll tell you what, we are inching up on 4,000. It's awesome. I think the West Coast is going to be joining us pretty soon. Uh, it's about, uh, you know, about 530 over there. So let's see what Twitter's going to. This almost like playing Russian uh, roulette. Uh, let's see. So Kristen, uh, Parley Parties, uh, I kind of got uh, to what you were saying there. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, okay. Okay, so um, let's see. All right. Um, as far as that goes, all right. Uh, yes. Um, yes. Swag, uh, swag gangsta is, uh, you know, is watching and your students are watching. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, who, what, when? Okay, the Free Soilers, M. Okay, now what we want to remember about the Free Soilers, this was during the Antebellum period. Okay, this is, this is the Antebellum period and the abolitionists. Now, remember that the abolitionists were morally motivated. Okay, they were motivated by morality and they wanted to stop slavery everywhere and they wanted to stop slavery now. Okay, and so now the thing is, what we need to keep in mind is that today, everybody's an abolitionist, right? I mean, I don't, I hope there's nobody watching um, out of the 3,800 people watching that, you know, is okay with slavery. That would not be a good thing. But, you know, it was something that was there that most people had accepted as a fact of life. And especially when it was a, you know, it was very firmly ingrained into the economy and society. And so as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, just to make clear, you have these free soilers that come up. And Abraham Lincoln, before the Civil War, was not an abolitionist. He was a free soiler. Okay. And so the free soilers, it's not that... Um, you know, that they want to get rid of slavery entirely. They may not like slavery, but they want to keep slavery out of the Western territories. OK, um, this is actually not uh, the exact slide I wanted to uh, wanted to show you all. Uh, let's see. So I just want to contrast abolitionism and free soil. Now, abolitionism was something that was for, yes, uh, abolitionism was something that was appealing to morality. And those things don't tend to be quite as popular as things that, that appeal to human self-interest. Um, so abolitionism, get rid of slavery everywhere and now, whereas free soilers stop the westward expansion of slavery. The abolitionists were driven by morality, whereas the free soilers were driven by, uh, you know, by racism and, you know, economic concerns and stuff like that. Now, one thing we might want to note here is that remember when we're comparing, we always want to uh, want to say, well, here are some things that they have in common. Here's something that they have in common. So both of these, although one of them is about morality and one of them's more radical than the other, uh, you know, we also have that they're both anti-slavery movements. Okay, sometimes PowerPoint can be a little funny here when you try to add a little something to the table. Um, but both of them, ladies and gentlemen, are anti-slavery movements. So I would note there, both of them are anti-slavery movements, but one is more radical than the other. Now, one of the, uh, you know, one of the most often cited uh, free soil documents is the Wilmot Proviso. Now, the Wilmot Proviso never passed 
but it was something that kind of put the, th the free soil platform out there. OK, so the Wilmot Proviso uh, said that any land that was taken in a war with Mexico would not have slavery. And so the free soilers, what this does when you think about a turning point, continuity and change over time, uh, what you're thinking about here is that the you know that the that the free soilers they are not going to abide by this old formula before the Mexican War uh, that said that okay we're going to uh, have a free state and a slave state and a free state and a slave state and all that kind of stuff. Um, so as far as that. Um, all right. So as far as that, they're stopping that. Now, remember also, I like to compare free soil to containment during the Cold War. OK, so containment during the Cold War, because that's something that remember Truman wasn't trying to eradicate communism. He was just trying to keep communism from spreading. And so that's what you're looking at, uh, what you're looking at there. Let me run over to Instagram and give some shout outs uh, to anybody that's uh, decided to follow me on there during the broadcast. OK. So we've got uh, got a few people, perhaps. Let's see. Um, Nanoparticle, thanks for the uh, for the follow there at Tom Ritchie. Um, let's see your fave, Kentucky. All right, uh, Jasmine Abraham, thank you so much for the recent follow. Rachel Williams, Spam Frank. I doubt that's his real name. Um, let's see. Um, do we have a okay? So good, Young Bones. Uh, then we've got uh, Jillian Ketchner, uh, Tanner Wynn. Uh, then uh, FLB217. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all so much for the Instagram follows. Oh, and y'all got me to 10,000 followers. How about that, ladies and gentlemen? Thank y'all so much. Uh, that was very nice of y'all. Y'all were here uh, when I found out I had 10,000 Instagram followers. We almost have 4,000 people watching this thing. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, the Spanish-American War, what even happened? Okay. So Celeste, um, the thing is that the Spanish-American War now, what's interesting here is that, you know, often that the, you know, that the government is trying to push the people into a war. Now, the Spanish-American War, of course, um, you know, basically the United States has started. This is 1898. Now, 1898 is a year that I think is important because, first of all, that's the year that the United States annexes Hawaii. Uh, that is also the year that we have the Spanish-American War. So, you know, if the backdrop of this is that Cuba is fighting for its independence. Now, let's remember the Monroe Doctrine. The Monroe Doctrine um, is basically, you know, where George H.W. Bush said, read my lips, no new taxes. And of course, he broke that promise. But but at the same time, uh, you know, read my lips, no new taxes. James Monroe in the Monroe Doctrine saying, read my lips, no new colonies, except he was Southern. So he'd probably say it a little bit more like me. Right. And so no new colonies. Now, we don't have a problem with the existing European colonies. We just don't want Europeans starting new colonies. So in the 1890s, when the Cubans are fighting for their independence against Spain, uh, you know, the United States, I mean, Spain ruling Cuba doesn't violate the Monroe Doctrine, but gosh, wouldn't it be nice from a policy perspective if we didn't have to worry about Spain over there? But the gov our government didn't want to get into a war with Spain or anything like that. Now, enter yellow journalism, okay? That's kind of like the 1890s version of so-called fake news. OK, it's like we know that the news media, uh, you know, likes to, you know, that whether it's, you know, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, uh, any of the papers, they they show you what you want to see. And that's what sells. Not necessarily, you know, sometimes the media is like, oh, we're keeping you informed. It's like, well, you know what? I'm being informed as a result of what you're doing, but you're making money now. Yellow journalism is very like cynical kind of approach. It's like we're putting things in these papers that, you know, are basically like the main blew up. The warship main blew up in the Havana Harbor and we don't know what happened to it. It could have been an accident. Somebody could have done something to it. But, you know, yellow journalism is about, you know, basically drumming up a public outcry in order to increase circulation. If you can if you can create these sensational headlines, then that something that sells papers. This is the days back when the, you know, back when the uh, newsboys were on the corner, you know, extra, extra, read all about it and that sort of thing. Okay. So let me go ahead and show you a few things, a few examples of yellow journalism. Okay. Yellow journalism. 
So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes now today, um, if you're a good journalist, you will, you may win a Pulitzer Prize. Okay. Pulitzer Prize. Now the Pulitzer Prize is named for Joseph Pulitzer, who was the publisher of the New York World. And he and William Randolph Hearst of the New York Journal, uh, you know, they were competing for circulation, just like the body needs circulation. Newspapers need circulation as well in order to, uh, you know, in order to live, really, in order to make a profit. Right. And so basically, if we look at the New York World here, main explosion caused by bomb or torpedo. Now, note the question mark, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. So it's like, we're not saying that that's what happened. All we're saying here is that, you know, all we're saying here, we're asking a question. Maybe it was a bomb or a torpedo or something like that. I mean, we're not trying to, uh, you know, we're not trying to say what happened or what didn't happen or anything like that, but you see that it's getting people all riled up. Okay. And we're just asking the questions. Now then, you know, you see here, a great font work here. Crisis is at hand. Growing belief in Spanish treachery. Now you think the newsboys, you know, they're like, crisis is at hand. Spanish treachery, Maine destroyed by an outside attack. Naval officers believe. So, you know, it may not have been destroyed by an outside attack, but, you know, we're just telling you what people believe. And so McKinley is suspicious of Spanish plots. There we go. And then what I love here is $50,000, a reward for giving the New York Journal. William Randolph Hearst, being a great American patriot, is, you know, saying that, like, look, um, I'm giving a $50,000 reward if people can, uh, you know, if people can tell me what's, uh, you know, what's going on on here. And uh, thank you for the uh, for the follow, uh, Papaya, uh, Maya, Papaya, whatever, Maya, Patel, Papaya, whatever you call in yourself nowadays, and Connie, uh, Connie Wang, um, and uh, Shane. All right. But the thing is, remember, $50,000, this is pre-Federal Reserve dollars. We've got to multiply that by 20. And so it's basically a million dollar reward, one million dollars. Now, Assistant Secretary Roosevelt convinced the explosion of the warship was not an accident. Destruction of the warship Maine was the work of an enemy. So this is like the media is drumming, drumming up all of this, uh, you know, all, all of this controversy. And that's what's getting us, uh, you know, involved um, in this. OK, Alex Leggins, thank you very much. Uh, hopefully that first Peter 114 helps you out tomorrow morning on your exam. All right. So as far as that uh, goes now, remember, if you're doing your exam tomorrow, a funny thing to do would be if you're going to write about Secretary Roosevelt, Supreme Leader line through it. Secretary Roosevelt. Okay. Remember if you put a line through it, they can't read it. The reader will probably find it amusing and it will identify you as part of our little community here. Okay. A community of almost like 4,000 people. I mean, that's like, we've almost got 1% of the exam in here. Some people probably watching it together. So, you know, tell your friends, like, let's make the Supreme Leader thing a thing on the DBQ and LEQ. All right. So let's see what else is coming in here. All right. So, um, so very, okay. So, uh, so Bell, is asking for uh, some of the stuff here um, that Stono, Shays, and Bacon's Rebellion. Okay. Now, one thing that I think is important to note is, you know, making a, making a distinction between slave rebellions and the frontier settler rebellions, or sometimes what I refer to as disgruntled white rebellions. Okay. That uh, basically, you know, the Stono Rebellion was an early slave rebellion that, uh, you know, you may not, you know, have any reason to uh, put it in there, but, uh, but that was during the colonial period. Uh, now, Bacon's Rebellion, and one thing about Bacon's Rebellion, I've got a video on colonial Virginia um, that, you know, where I go into Bacon's Rebellion. OK, so as, as far as far as that goes, Bacon's Rebellion is kind of a turning point in some ways, because in the early part, uh, you know, when Virginia was first colonized. OK, let me go ahead and pull up some visuals here. Um, all right. So ladies and gentlemen, and uh, just to note here, several of you have signed up for the fireside chat. Now, remember, I am limiting that to uh, I'm limiting that to 30 people. OK, so right now, um, let's see that we've got. Um, 
let me just make sure um we've got uh, 11 people signed up 19 spots left in the fireside chat i want that to be a classroom size group of people where i'm answering everybody's questions okay remember if you're on the east coast don't buy that go to bed okay um and so as far as that goes ladies and gentlemen we are looking for colonial virginia okay so let's go ahead and go into uh the virginia colony ladies and gentlemen all right so as far as that is concerned let me go over to bacon's rebellion all right so the first the original source of labor these were indentured servants okay wow we passed four thousand, ladies and gentlemen all right so uh we got all of our supreme leaders of a push here thank y'all for joining this hangout now so Bacon's Rebellion. Now, when we look at this indentured servitude, okay, now the reason for indentured, indentured servants are being brought over to work these tobacco fields that John Rolfe, uh, Supreme Leader John Rolfe, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, discovered a way to make tobacco more palatable. It became popular. It was a sweeter strain of tobacco and it became Virginia's cash crop. Now, brown gold, because they thought, well, the Spanish are bringing all this gold back. When the Jamestown settlers first got there, they were prospecting for gold. Um, but John Rawl found this, this sweeter strain of tobacco that became popular. And so as far as that goes, that became popular, but it's labor intensive. And so at first they were bringing in indentured servants, these poor Europeans who agreed to a fixed term of labor in return for passage across the Atlantic. Now, African slaves later became the dominant labor force. Now, an indenture is a contract. What it is, it looks like somebody bit it. Okay. So they make identical contracts and then they tear it in half and you can put the two contracts together to verify that they are, uh, you know, they are alike. And so in 1619, the first African slaves, 20 African slaves arrived in Virginia, uh, you know, I believe on a Dutch ship, even though there seem to be some different accounts of that. And so now the thing is that it's not like in 1619, all of a sudden slaves became the dominant labor force. It took a while that you see here. It's not until the last quarter of the 17th century after 1675 that we really see slavery become the dominant labor force and a large increase in the number of slaves. Uh, before 1650, there are very, very few African slaves. And so now 1676. That was Bacon's Rebellion, where essentially a lot of these indentured servants, they finish their term of indenture. And then they move out to the frontier. Well, the Tidewater planters, you know, these people who live near the coast, they're the ones who were represented in the House of Burgesses. And so they're thinking about the things that are good for them. And, you know, Bacon's Rebellion, it's these uh, frontier settlers, these frontier farmers who were like, you know what, you're not protecting us from Indian tax. You know, you're not legislating on behalf of the people who live on the frontier. So you've got this massive rebellion and, and it's not necessarily an accident. People note, to, people note kind of the coincidence here that Bacon's Rebellion happens about the time that, you know, Virginia plans start to prefer slaves as their labor force rather than indentured servants. So that is a big deal there. Okay, so uh, so ladies and gentlemen, let's see what we've uh, what we've got coming up here. And remember, uh, if you want to get into the fireside chat, that's at tomritchie.net slash a push. All right, so let's see what we've got uh, what we've got here. All right, and uh, Jacob, remember, I've already got stuff on the LEQ. I mentioned uh, some stuff there, and I'm showing that once in a while. Okay, and uh, Noel, just want to you know as far as re reconstruction. Um, I think that uh, differentiating between presidential reconstruction and radical reconstruction is an important thing here. And let me see actually what I've got here um, that I could that I could show you on that. OK, so let me just take a quick look here and see if I can uh, see if I can pull that up. OK, so let's see. Um, all right. Review. All right. Oops. Okay. Let's see what I can find here. Okay. So, all right. So the thing is, you know, Jacob Fink, a uh, longtime supporter. Thank you, Jacob. Wanted to know something about the LEQ and Noel's asking about the reconstruction period. Okay. Um, was Jacob's tweet deleted? Oh no. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. 
and we're going to take a look at you know how we could set up an leq on reconstruction okay so let's say that we got a question that was basically like evaluate the extent to which presidential and radical reconstruction were different from each other um you know comparison leqs a lot of times are the easiest to write we don't know uh which type of leq will be on your exam tomorrow now Remember that we have to think about what was unique to presidential reconstruction, what was unique to radical reconstruction, and what did they have in common? We want to remember that the reconstruction amendments are the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. Now, presidential reconstruction are you know now both reconstruction plans are trying to put the country back together both amended the constitution both gave african americans more rights than they had had previously okay and uh thank you uh donovan phil for giving me more instagram followers um than i've had previously and so as far as that goes though that Radical Reconstruction went much further than presidential Reconstruction. Lincoln's Reconstruction was about the 13th Amendment, which was only about abolishing slavery as a legal institution. Now, I often ask my students, what did the 13th Amendment do? They say abolish slavery. And then I ask them, what else did the 13th Amendment do? And then, you know, they start answering. They're like, did it let, let people vote? Uh, did it give them citizenship? No, 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 no. Um, and so as far as that goes, you know, it's not giving them any of, uh, you know, any of that. Um, so it's really very, very simple because remember, Dred Scott said that African Americans cannot be citizens. The Supreme Court had said that. So when the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, it did not make African American citizens. Thank you for the Instagram follow, Cassidy. And then you have the black codes okay the black codes were basically i mean the 13th amendment passed and slavery was no longer a legal institution but the southern states passed the black codes lincoln said you know remember lincoln's trying and this goes back to the civil war the civil war and reconstruction are best understood in one context and remember that while lincoln did champion the 13th amendment you know the slaves were freed under his watch that his primary goal in fighting the civil war War was always to preserve the Union. And he was always very, very clear about that, that he intended to preserve the Union. And so, you know, he treated the Confederate states that like, you never really left because you legally couldn't leave the Union anyway, as far as Lincoln saw it. And so come back in and it's not the federal government's job to tell you what you're going to do with your social hierarchy. Uh, you know, Lincoln had a, a, had, a, had a legitimate conservative streak about him. I mean, he was somebody that didn't like to see too much change all at one time. And so a lot of, uh, you know, black Americans had to enter into sharecropping arrangements. Their, uh, you know, their lives weren't functionally a whole lot different than they'd been under slavery, except now they could get into debt because they were freed, but they weren't given anything uh, to start off or anything like that. And remember that Lincoln's reconstruction plan was the 10% plan, where basically just 10% of the voters swear an oath of allegiance to the United States and they accept a emancipation and you're back in the union. I refer to this as discount reconstruction. Uh, you know, think about the car lot ad, you know, ours is a uh, key of Greer, uh, you know, around here in upstate South Carolina. Now, radical reconstruction, you know, went a lot further. Instead of just the modest uh, 13th Amendment, uh, you know, you've got the 14th and the 15th Amendment. Uh, you know, so the 14th Amendment gave birthright citizenship to everyone. So it clarified that everyone is a citizen. Thank you, Pat Manning 10, for the Instagram uh, follow there. Uh, and so then, uh, you know, 14th Amendment, birthright citizenship, equal protection of laws, and also several things to punish the Confederacy. If y'all remember um, the, the former Confederacy, the Wade Davis bill, a lot of that, that was codified in the 14th Amendment, uh, the bill that Lincoln pocket vetoed. And so the 14th Amendment said that Confederate leaders can't vote um, and that, uh, you know, basically anybody that had loaned money to the Confederacy, they're going to lose that money. OK. And so as far as uh, as far as that goes, we've got uh, that. And so um, 
Yep, Kate Felton, thanks for the follow and friends with uh, my friend Richa. Um, hopefully y'all do well in your exam tomorrow. And then the 15th Amendment, uh, you know, gave black men the right to vote, of course, passing over white women who didn't get to vote until the progressive era, the 19th Amendment, uh, you know, which was also right after a war. And so the 15th Amendment said you can't stop somebody from voting because of race, color or previous condition of servitude. Now say it with me here. Race, color or previous condition of servitude. And so, you know, you've got this and then political equality for freedmen, including voting rights. Okay. So that's something that went a lot farther than anything that Supreme Leader, draw a line through it. I mean, President Lincoln, you know, his reconstruction plan was much more limited. Okay. And so that's what I would see with reconstruction. Hip Hughes has a great video where he talks about hugs and slugs. Okay. Now, the other thing that we want to note here is that radical reconstruction, uh, you know, largely failed because of a lack of support in the North. Now, of course, in the South, uh, a lot of Southern whites were very bitter about reconstruction, but at the same time, uh, you know, a lot of these, uh, you know, a lot of these uh, Southern whites, of course, would be against it. But a lot of Northern whites, uh, you know, they weren't really on board with this and support for radical reconstruction flagged. And with the Compromise of 1877, what ends up happening is that the Southern states return to white democratic rule. And from that, uh, you know, basically you've got this period of Jim Crow, uh, which had racial segregation and then the erosion of political equality and voting rights um, for black Americans. So you had, uh, you know, literacy tests and poll taxes, but then you could be exempt if your grandfather could vote, what's called the grandfather clause, okay? Where if your grandfather could vote, you can get in for, you know, you get in for free. And even today we refer to that as being grandfathered in, you know, if somebody has already been a part of something and they get a special exception for something, that is called being grandfathered grandfathered in. So that's uh, that's something that you want to uh, note on that. 11 spots left for the Fireside Chat webinar that'll start at 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. at 7 p.m. Pacific. Remember, if you're on the East Coast, please don't buy that. This is something for, uh, you know, people in other time zones that don't need to go to bed and rest up for the exam. But once you to know that there are 11 spots remaining for what's going to basically be like almost like me with a classroom size group of people where I'm speaking to you personally. OK, um, so as far as that, we've got 11 spots left for that. And ladies and gentlemen, remember the Romulus A Push Review app is a handy little thing for two ninety nine. dollars uh, that can help you out. That is available at the App Store and at Google Play. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to Twitter and see what's waiting for us there. And um, let's see, uh, Cameron Samarco. And then we've got uh, we've got here uh, Anaya. Thank you so much for the follow. And Stella Tubby, Stelly Welly. I think that's a Finsta. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, go over important Supreme Court cases. OK, so uh, so Chris, um, now, uh, you know what we need to know about the Supreme Court. First of all, the Marshall Court cases are very, very important. OK, uh, the Marshall Court. Now, remember John Marshall, who was a Federalist. OK, now, if we refer to John Marshall, if we've got reason for that on the DBQ, Hurley Q, uh, you could refer to him as Supreme Leader John Marshall draw a line through Supreme Leader. And of course, his real title is John Marshall. Okay. So, uh, I mean, wait, that's his name is John Marshall. It's been a long couple weeks, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, his title was Chief Justice. Okay. So let me go into the Marshall Court here because I think that showing you kind of a big picture would be a good thing to have here. All right. So as far as John Marshall versus Thomas Jefferson. Okay. Uh, and remember Thomas Jefferson was, uh, you know, the one of the authors of the Virginia and Kentucky resolutions. So when we're comparing Jefferson and Marshall, uh, you know, Jefferson was a state's rights guy, whereas Marshall as a federalist believed in a strong central government where strict or loose construction. Now, there aren't many times when it's okay to use Comic Sans, but, uh, you know, loose construction, I think, is one of those handful of times when it's okay to use Comic Sans. OK, that uh, that's something that I think that, you know, it's kind of a Comic Sans interpretation of the Constitution. 
And so as far as that goes, uh, you know, then the National Bank. Now, of course, uh, thank you so much, uh, Hannah Felton from not. Oh, wait, Webb, Hannah, I'm probably going to meet you. I may meet you. I'm going to Webb on Monday. OK, I, I'm planning to go to Webb School in Knoxville on Monday uh, to talk to the uh, the AP Euro students. So, yes, that is so exciting. OK, so I may be meeting you, Hannah. That's awesome. Looking forward to that. Hope you are, too. Thanks for liking all those uh, those pictures there. So, uh, you know, you probably are excited about that, too. But I I am very much uh, looking forward uh, to uh, visiting my friend over there. All right. So the National Bank, John Marshall believed as a federalist, believing in a strong central government, loose construction, implied powers that the National Bank was constitutional, whereas Jefferson believed it was unconstitutional. Uh, John Marshall tend to tended to favor commerce and business, whereas Jefferson's an agriculture guy. And then Marbury v. Madison. Uh, Marbury v. Madison, remember that term judicial review, OK, that the Supreme Court can declare laws to be unconstitutional. Constitutional. This power appears nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, this is something that this is a power that the Supreme Court is giving itself. OK. And so as far as that, uh, that is concerned. Now, Jefferson, remember, believed in the compact theory of the Constitution that said really that the Constitution is a compact between the states and that the states have the ability and the right to interpret it. Whereas in Marbury v. Madison, John Marshall saying it's the Supreme Court. All right. The other two big Marshall Court cases that I often refer to are McCulloch versus Maryland. Now, the big picture is important here because McCulloch versus Maryland, let's think about it. On one hand, we got the Bank of the United States. On the other hand, we've got a state. Hmm. National Bank or a state. John Marshall is going to go with the National Bank. He said that the state of Maryland could not tax the National Bank because the National Bank is a legitimate function of the central government. It may not be in the Constitution. It may not be an enumerated power, but because he's got a Hamiltonian Federalist interpretation of the Constitution and he looks at the Elastic clause, necessary and proper. He believes the bank is necessary and proper. All right. Thank you, Patrick Moore and, and Supreme Macy for your Instagram follows. All right. And then finally, there is Gibbons versus Ogden. I always use this as an excuse to watch Steamboat Willie uh, in a push. But basically, there was a steamship line operated by, you know, New York had given Robert Fulton, uh, you know, in his company, a monopoly on steamship transportation. Now, there's another competing company company that was running between New York and New Jersey. And so John Marshall said, well, you know what? And this is really not that controversial to me. I mean, because the Commerce Clause says the federal government controls interstate commerce. And so the Marshall Court ruled that the uh, you know, that the state, you know, that the state cannot keep commerce from coming in, cannot grant a monopoly when other people are, uh, you know, are doing this. OK, so, yes. Uh, oh, so Webb is the uh, Webb is the goat. OK, looking forward to that. Uh, Mary Caroline, uh, you know, looking forward to going to uh, Webb. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, Miss Rowcliffe is one of my favorite people. OK, and I am really looking forward to that. But anyway, the Commerce Clause. Now, I also was talking about Jim Crow. Crow, okay, so during the Jim Crow era, of course, Plessy v. Ferguson, uh, which was, uh, you know, saying that separate but equal, you know, the, the 14th Amendment guarantees every American birthright citizenship and equal protection of laws. But the thing is, if I have, uh, you know, if I have a uh, pizza, all right, if I have a pizza and uh, let's see, um, and Megan Rapp has a pizza. Okay. Thanks, Megs, for the follow. So I've got a pizza and Megan has a pizza. Well, we both have a pizza. Okay. So, uh, you know, the Supreme Court and Plessy said, you know, it says equal protection of laws, but it doesn't necessarily say, you know, together. And so the railroad car, as long as there is a car for white people and a car for black people and everybody gets to ride on the train, there's no violation of the 14th Amendment. So Plessy versus Ferguson puts the rubber stamp on Jim Crow segregation, where it will remain until 1954 when Brown v. Board, the Supreme Court and Brown v. Board overturned Plessy v. Ferguson. OK, and so Brown v. Board overturned that. Now, another one, I'd mentioned the Dred Scott case where the Supreme Court said that uh, the federal government cannot 
uh, cannot regulate slavery in the territories. Okay, the federal government cannot regulate slavery in the territories. So that is another one. Okay, now World War II, I might think about uh, Korematsu versus the United States. Uh, the Japanese internment during World War II, uh, you know, is an embarrassing chapter um, in our history, but even more embarrassing because as far as uh, as far as that goes, it's even more embarrassing because it was U.S. citizens and the Supreme Court uh, rubber stamped it uh, in a 6-3 decision. Now, in the 1980s, when Reagan was president, um, that was... Uh, you know, the United States passed uh, a law that gave reparations to survivors and their families, um, but a very embarrassing way to treat U.S. citizens, uh, you know, during, uh, you know, during wartime, uh, people who are citizens of this country. Um, I tell you what, uh, Miss Groover from Kinston High School, uh, the way that you've contacted me, usually I don't like to reward that, uh, but you know what, since it's the night before the exam, we'll go ahead and give that shout out, okay? Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. All right. So, uh, looks like uh, we've still got about eight spots left for tonight's fireside chat. Uh, looking forward to chatting with a smaller group of you. And actually, I mean, we're getting so many different questions. Sorry, I can't see everybody's. Um, Okay, so as far as uh, as far as that goes, all right. So remember now, Ashley, I'm going to tell you that uh, the progressive era. What we've got, we've got a few things here. We've got the increasing urbanization um, of America at that time. Now, the United States had been a very rural society before for that. Okay, so. Uh, what happens here is that, uh, you know, we are becoming more urbanized. We've got, uh, you know, these new immigrants coming in. Now, the new immigrants, now the Irish during the antebellum period. Now, it's very important that you know when things happen, that you've got kind of a timeline of immigration, that immigration uh, traditionally came from during the colonial period and before, uh, you know, the progressive era, before 1890, most immigration came from Northern and Western Europe. Now, the Irish, weren't especially welcomed on a part of them on account of them being Catholic. Remember, the United States is still about half Protestant today, but before the Irish immigration and the new immigrants, um, it was overwhelming overwhelmingly Protestant, okay? And so the new immigrants are coming in. They're coming from Southern and Eastern Europe, Italy, Greece, uh, you know, Russia and Poland, places like that. And these immigrants uh, weren't uh, welcome. Now, remember the Irish, uh, you know, got these things, no Irish need apply. You had the, uh, the Know Nothing Party that mobilized against uh, immigration. And so Basically, during the progressive era, these immigrants are coming in. So you've got these immigrants that need to be assimilated. Um, and so, you know, you've got people like Jane Addams, uh, you know, Supreme Leader Jane, Jane Addams, if you will. Now, Jane Addams, A-D-D-A-M-S, she operated the whole house. Now, to me, this is a pretty boring, uh, you know, kind of thing, but it, they like to put it on exams, uh, you know, but the whole house uh, was something, a place where immigrants could go in order to to learn, they could take English classes, they could maybe get childcare, they could learn some job skills. Uh, it was a community center to help these immigrants to become assimilated. So basically, when you look at the cause of the progressive, uh, you know, the progressive era. Now, another thing here, we want to get into muckrakers, uh, which muckrakers, in some ways, there are some similarities we could draw to yellow journalism because it sold books and papers, but it had a higher social purpose. It wasn't cynical like yellow journalism. Now, Jacob Riss or Jacob Rees, it is a written test here, but let me go ahead and just uh, show you this. They like to put um, his work on tests. His work's actually on the, at the public A push practice exam, but he wrote this book. Uh, he was a photographer. He, he was an immigrant photographer. Of course, he came from Northern Europe, uh, but uh, you know, he went into the immigrant communities in New York City and took pictures of this is how people are living. Uh, you know, the affluent areas of New York City City never got to see this. All right. So, you know, he had drawings, he had pictures, uh, you know, he had, they don't really have the best pictures on here, but uh, let's see. Uh, a tenement family. Okay. So this picture is, is often, uh, you know, referenced here. When you look at this, you see like this family of seven people 
they've probably got one more room, but you can see they don't have a lot of room. You've got a crib, you've got a bed, you've got a stove, and there's all the family there. And so this is the sort of conditions that people are living in in the tenements. So the progressives are thinking, how can we um, help these immigrants assimilate? that are coming in from Southern and Eastern Europe. Now I've got a, a video on the progressive era amendments. Okay. That I'm just going to kind of preview for y'all. Now, if you want to go more in depth, you can always watch this, uh, this video. Um, but let me go into the progressive amendments. Okay. So the amendments, to the constitution, if we want to understand progressives, okay, I've given uh, four criteria here and this is going to take a little bit. Uh, this is where maybe having uh, too many tabs open may not be the best thing in the world, but let me get some of these PowerPoints closed um, so that uh, we don't have that uh, that issue here. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, yes, go ahead and save that. All right. Amendments are like wolves. They travel in packs. Now what you want to remember here, and this is pretty important. Okay. We just talked about the reconstruction amendments a little while ago, but the first 10 amendments to the bill of rights 1789 to 91. This is very, very quick. All right. So then between 1791 and 1865, you've got only two amendments that are passed between that time. And then in a five year period, you've got three amendments and then no amendments between 1913 and 19 or no amendments until 1913. Uh, you know, under the uh, presidency of Supreme Leader, draw a line for, through it. I mean, President Woodrow Wilson. OK, so as far as that uh, as far as that goes, um, we've got uh, that and then 16 through 19. OK, so then really the progressives, uh, you know, American conservatives tend to idolize the founding fathers. You know that these were people who crafted a government document based on timeless principles that will never change. Um, the progressives felt like the Constitution could use some major revisions to keep up with the times. Okay. And so as far as that goes, um, you know, we've got, uh, we've got that. Now I wrote a preamble. If the progressives had a preamble to their amendments, it would read something like this. We, the progressives of the United States, in order to form a stronger central government, organize society based on scientific principles, regulate business, promote moral improvement, and secure the blessings of democracy to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish these amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America. And I get into the goals of the progressives. Stay hydrated, kids. Um, science, they wanted to make a stronger central government that would legislate based on scientific principles, moral improvement, the regulation of business, and political democracy. So your four amendments here, which uh, tend to enlarge the power of the federal government, uh, tend to, uh, you know, at the, at the expense of the states, and also promote the regulation of business and moral improvement and that sort of thing. Now, the federal income tax, the 16th Amendment, basically moves tax collection from the tariff, where it had been in the Gilded Age, very high tariffs during that time, um, to uh, you know, to the income tax and also the income tax, a graduated income tax was one of the things that the populists were wanting. And then the 17th Amendment, direct election of senators. Now that goes back to muckraking. There was a muckraking piece about how corrupt the Senate was, was perceived to be. And so remember the original constitution had senators put in by the state, uh, state legislature. So now direct election of senators, making it more democratic prohibition of alcohol, making a more moral society, and then finally women's suffrage, which also you could see with that, uh, that, you know, women's suffrage, uh, when we look at that, the 19th Amendment, we could say that that promoted political democracy and remember that women, you know, vote more on like moral issues. Like, you know, a woman is more likely to cast a vote, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, her moral compass uh, than a man is. And so remember the 16th Amendment, the income tax, um, the 17th, the direct election of senators, the 18th uh, you know, prohibition, and of course the 18th amendment, the only amendment to be repealed by another amendment. And remember, 18th amendment, you can't drink. 21st amendment, you can drink. Um, so now one thing I want to note while I'm while I'm looking at this um, is we want to note, you know, I've seen Frederick Jackson Turner mentioned before, and he talks about the significance of the frontier in American history, that America is constantly being reborn on the frontier. Uh, you know, Jack uh, Turner's 
thesis, the Turner thesis, you could kind of see this when it comes to women's suffrage. A lot of these Western states were actually the first to let women vote, which just like it was states like Tennessee and Kentucky. Another shout out to my friends at Webb School that I'm uh, going to get to see on Monday. Uh, you know, that they were the ones who eliminated property ownership requirements. You know, Jackson was the first president from, you know, a state west of the Appalachian Mountains from Tennessee. Now, we see another expansion of democracy here where, you know, this was in the West. Now, they had had the frontier lifestyle. When you think about this, you know, in the East, uh, you know, they treated women as delicate and weak and that sort of thing. Now, think about it. On the frontier, a woman's got to, you know, rough it out there with everybody else. If the wagon's stuck on the Oregon Trail, you can't say like, oh, we're just going to let the men unstick this wagon, okay? And so, as far as that goes, it's these Western states. Wyoming was the first state. Uh, to uh, recognize women's suffrage. So prior to 1920, we see that these states out West already had, uh, you know, they already had women's suffrage. Uh, and then note that in the East, you have very limited suffrage or in some cases, no suffrage. All right. Um, and so the farther East you get, the less rights. Now, New York State, it was right before the, the, the 19th Amendment was passed that they allowed full suffrage. But it's mostly out here in the West. So you see it going West to East, which of course today you can see like marijuana laws in the United States, like states with allowing the recreational use of marijuana um, are in the West, except for the states in, you've got three states in New England. Okay. So um, man, they're feeling the burn over there in Vermont. And so as far as that goes, the West to East thing where we see democracy moving from West uh, to East. All right. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my friend JC is asking me about a history of like national banks. Okay. Now, Hamilton, of course, uh, gets the first bank of the United States had a 20 year charter. Okay. The first bank of the United States had a 20 year charter, 1791 to 1811. Now, when Jefferson became president, he didn't try to get rid of the bank, didn't try like Andrew Jackson to take the deposits out and kill it before its term was over. But in in 1811, Madison let the charter lapse. Decided, you know, that's not in the Constitution. We don't need that. Now, enter the war of 1812. Um, then we see here that, you know, the, you know, the United States is in massive debt after the war of 1812. And so Madison approves two things that Jefferson's party didn't really like, uh, you know, before um, the tariff of 1816, which was the first properly protective tariff. Now, this was part of Henry Clay's American system. Now, I remember Henry Clay's American system using the acronym NIP, National Bank Internal Improvements protective tariff. Okay. National Bank Internal Improvements Protective Tariff. Now, remember Henry Clay had been a war hawk. And besides the Battle of New Orleans at the end, uh, you know, it didn't really go so well in the War of 1812. So the American system was about making us less dependent on Europe and more ready to develop a more industrial economy uh, that was ready to fight a war. Okay. And so the American system, like two parts of that, Madison signed after the War of 1812. Now, remember, we also saw the end of the first party system, the first two party system. And so that's something that, you know, we see we see the end of that. And, you know, so when we're, so when we are looking at that, you've got the second bank of the United States in 18, uh, 1816. And then Jackson, when he gets elected to office. Now, remember, that is the second two party system, the Democrats and the Whigs. And Jackson is much more of a Jeffersonian. He's a states rights guy. He's not a fan of banks. He saw banks as institutions that enrich the rich and kept the poor where they are. And Jackson believed that a laissez faire economy and the government staying out of things was the best way for the common man um, to have. You know, he believed in the common man, right, Bailey? If you're watching one of my actual students, um, that he believed that the national bank was helping the rich stay rich and was keeping poor people poor and was not providing opportunity. That's not government's job to make rich people richer. And so Jackson, uh, you know, decided to start removing deposits from the bank. Uh, he vetoed the recharter of the bank bill. And so, you know, the, the recharter. And so Henry Clay decided in 1832, I'm going to run against Andrew Jackson. I'm going to make this a referendum on the bank. Well, he lost. Kind of like, uh, you know, 
know, when the election of 1920 was supposed to be a solemn referendum on the league and Woodrow Wilson's perspective, uh, his his party lost that. And so never make an election about one issue. That's not uh, typically um, a good idea. And so as far as uh, as far as that goes, uh, Jackson, you know, under Jackson, the bank ends up in 19 in 1836 lapsing. Now, then during the progressive era. Now, the progressives are not so into laissez-faire. That's what began our federal reserve system. So, you know, in the essence, you know, with having a stronger central government and allowing organization to happen, the federal reserve is a creature of the progressive era. So that way we have the centralized institution with experts. Progressives love experts that would regulate things. And we've had that ever since. All right, JC, always a pleasure, my friend. And uh, that's uh, always good to hear from you. Now, uh, let's go to uh, let's go to Twitter. And also we will check our, uh, you know, our new uh, Instagram followers. Um, Axel, uh, thank you so much for uh, liking all those uh, photos. Um, and then uh, Bryce 752. All right. So uh, Caitlin Conley, you know what, Caitlin, you've asked me about the Korean War. And you know what this is? Um, you know, as far as that goes, um, since we're calling this uh, the uh, Supreme Leader Hangout, we should talk about the Korean War. OK, now, one thing is, OK, Truman's philosophy of containment. OK, remember the containment of communism. OK, so we want to contain it where it is. OK, so in this case, uh, what happened was the North, uh, you know, invaded the South. They were supposed to keep everything at the 38th parallel. OK. And so Truman is like, OK, we're going to contain communism. Now, this was the only military action ever uh, ever approved by the UN. OK, because what happened is at first the UN didn't recognize communist China. They let Taiwan represent China um, in the Security Council. And so then the Soviets boycotted. OK, they boycotted something. And so the UN, the Korean War was the only UN authorized military action. And of course, it was designed to thwart the aggression of North Korea versus South Korea. And Douglas MacArthur was placed in there. Now, the reason why Truman is going into the Korean War, one of them is this this policy of containment. And remember, stay hydrated, kids. And Catherine, if you're watching, here's that water bottle. I've got it here at home. Good luck on your exam tomorrow. Seriously, of course, of course, I'm serious. Like I want all my students, I need my actual students to do well. I want everybody to do well. Um, so as far as that goes, um, that Truman, when China fell to the communists, Truman was branded as soft on communism and you don't want to be soft on communism. And so Truman, you know, backs uh, this Korean war. Now remember the policy of containment. Now Douglas MacArthur, remember the bonus army uh, when, uh, you know, during the depression during Hoover's presidency, you had the bonus army and they are uh, marching on Washington. They're demanding a bonus in, uh, you know, 1932 that wasn't supposed to be paid until, uh, until 1945. And so Herbert Hoover, when they were coming into Washington and making a mess over there, um, Herbert Hoover gets Douglas MacArthur to, uh, you know, to, Oh, only one fireside chat ticket left. OK, so I just looked at that now. So Douglas MacArthur is tasked with getting the veterans out of Washington and he goes and not only gets them out of the city, but he goes to their camp and burns the thing to the ground. OK, and that's Douglas MacArthur. Douglas MacArthur, when the Chinese got involved in, uh, you know, this Korean War, because at first, like Douglas MacArthur with the Inchon landing, it was brilliant. And so he's pushing it. He's like, look, in war. Or there is no substitute for victory. Sounds like y'all tomorrow, right? And so Douglas MacArthur said when the Chinese got involved and they were throwing so many men at us, we couldn't hold those gains and we were being pushed back. MacArthur said, let's nuke them, okay? Because in war, there is no substitute for victory. Um, Supreme Leader Harry Truman, I mean, strike Supreme Leader, President Harry Truman, okay? President Harry Truman said, uh, you know, Douglas MacArthur, this is about containment. Get this back to the 38th parallel. Now, Douglas MacArthur then decided to take this to the public and remember that the president is the commander in chief. MacArthur was a very popular guy, but, uh, you know, when he challenged Truman publicly, Truman relieved him of command. And so at the end of the day, they had the line. Now, it's not right at 
the 38th parallel. It kind of snakes around some of it above, some of it below, but it's around the 38th parallel. And of course, uh, we'll see. Evidently, uh, President Trump and uh, Supreme Leader, we're not going to strike that out because Kim Jong-un is the Supreme Leader. Supreme Leader Kim Jong-un are going to meet, it looks like, in Singapore. And so maybe the Korean War is, I mean, it's like this is going to be historic because, you know, the United, I mean, like, I think President Trump just greeted those, uh, you know, those political prisoners that were released. Our Secretary of State brought back three political prisoners. But things have been like we have not had diplomatic relations with North Korea since then. So this is a really big deal. But yes, glad that I got to uh, that I got to get into uh, that I got to get into that. Um so as far as that, uh, shout out to uh, Jane Avery. If you're uh, if you're watching, looks like you've uh, faved a few things. So uh, glad that you're uh, that you're doing that or liked or whatever they call it and uh, representing the British over there. Um, so ladies and gentlemen and uh, CW Fawns uh, for the follow, Connor. Hopefully you do very well on your uh, you know on your thing tomorrow. Okay, and thank you. Just liked one of my or one of my actual student. I've got a few actual student memes. I've got some original memes, but I've also got got some actual student names. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, let's go back to, uh, let's go back to Twitter and see what's, uh, see what's going on there and see what kind of questions we've got. This thing's going to be concluding in a little bit, but then again, I might keep it going because I've got some energy. I tell you, y'all, y'all are giving me, we've all got dragon energy together. I think Kanye would be proud. Um, you know, I hope that I wish Kanye would like, you know, reach out to the A push people and wish us luck and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so as far as that, let's go see what uh, what Twitter's got for us. Speaking of uh, speaking of Kanye, and it looks like our fireside chat is sold out. Uh, so I look forward to getting together with thirty of you in a small group uh, set in a small group setting. Basically, it's going to be like a class uh, sized webinar uh, where I'm going to be able to personally interact with you and answer some of your questions. All right. Uh, so the shift in political party views, uh, Allison, you've been uh, you've been uh, helping me out. I followed you back, which means you've been supporting me for a while now in um, in this. It's a uh, realignment, ladies and gentlemen. The concept of realignment is when political parties tend to change. So, you know, two party says in the two party system, we have constant realignment and that and that happens. Uh, so, you know, for example, uh, the most, you know, some of the most recent realignments. Now, the New Deal coalition uh, was something that kept the Democratic Party largely in power throughout most of the mid 20th century. And that was built on a coalition of um, immigrants, uh, minorities, uh, northern Catholics, cities, and then southern whites. It's like, you know, these southern whites are there and just kind of one of these things not like the other. And FDR, now during the New Deal, FDR was very careful being a shrewd politician. Uh, you know, he did create opportunities for African Americans, um, you know, like the CCC camps. There would be, not that he integrated them, but it's like, you know, you had black CCC camps, white CCC camps, um, and the like. And so with that, with that, uh, you know, he was creating opportunities. You know, if you were a young black man, you could go work for the CCC now. But FDR never challenged the system of racial segregation in the South because that would that would take that would infuriate Southern whites who were a key part of his New Deal of his New Deal coalition. And so he didn't want uh, that to happen. Now, Harry Truman didn't care. In 1948, Harry Truman integrated the military by executive order because, you know, Harry Truman's commander in chief. And that's what spawned like the first major challenge to uh, the solid South, the Democratic Party's hold on the South that had been there ever since the, Amer you know, in, ever since the end of Reconstruction. And so Strom Thurmond of uh, South Carolina, uh, he ran for president with the Dixiecrat Party. And so, you know, now that didn't instantly, he only cover, you know, he only gained a few, you know, a few states, but he got some electoral votes. And over time, Time, uh, you know, you started to see the the south, you know, southern whites today are overwhelmingly Republican, and also um, laborers, uh, you know, people who are, uh, you know, in in the labor movement. Uh, you know, there are a lot of uh, skilled laborers that today, you know, working class people are getting. You know, working class people were a staple of the Democratic Party for a long time, and this was the first election most recently where people with a college degree were more likely to vote Democratic than Republican. So the coalitions constantly change and shift. Um, Richard Nixon was responsible for attracting a lot of the labor votes.
note, uh, Nixon with his Southern strategy and also for reaching out to labor. The Reagan Democrats, uh, these were labor laborers who tended to vote for Reagan, even though the labor union leaders uh, supported Democrats. And so you, you see that, you know, political coalitions, uh, you know, come and go and they are always uh, they are always changing. Um, Ansley Nichols, uh, thank you so much for all of the, uh, you know, for all of the likes and all of that kind of stuff on Instagram. Thank you so much. Uh, looking at some of that rich, so those Richie riffs I see going way back there. Um, all right. So ladies and gentlemen, let's go ahead and, uh, um, take a look at something else. Now, um, Hannah is asking about um, conservatism. OK, so, you know, asking about conservatism. Now, remember that the rise of the conservative movement, like in the 1960s, we really saw like the high tide of American liberalism. OK, so where you had Kennedy and Johnson and what's going on with, uh, you know, with Kennedy and Johnson, you know, civil rights legislation. Uh, also legislation with Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty and the great society and all of that kind of stuff where, you know, he's trying to, you know, make a more equitable society. And really the thing is though, that what ends up happening is the government takes on a whole lot more responsibility. And oftentimes government will make a lot of promises and they sound good. And then it's like government just doesn't do a great job of them. So in the 1970s, what you started to see was uh, what they call a uh, stagflation. It's like the, you know, the economy wasn't growing and then inflation is growing. So the economy is stagnant and inflation is growing. Inflation is not a problem as long as the economy is growing at the same rate. And so, you know, you had high taxes, you had the economy wasn't growing, people were disillusioned with that. And also you had a loss of trust in government because when you think about it, I got a question about the Vietnam War on Twitter. Okay. So uh, let's see here that Oh, wait, I thought I saw, so, you know, I don't know who asked that, but there was somebody asking about the, uh, yes, uh, Ashley is asking about the Vietnam War. Y'all remember your Supreme Leader hashtag. And remember, uh, just for fun, if you want to write Supreme Leader somewhere on your DBQ or LEQ and just cross it out, I think it'd be a lot of fun. Um, and so the Vietnam War started with the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. Now, before this, um, you know, what you had here in the Gulf, you know, before the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy had sent a advisors to Vietnam uh, to help the South Vietnamese uh, you know, to help the South Vietnamese defend themselves and organize their army. Now, with the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, uh, the USS Maddox had maybe been attacked, maybe not. Uh, my professor at Clemson, who literally wrote the book out on it, uh, believes that it wasn't attacked. OK. And so the thing is, Congress gives Lyndon Johnson a blank check. Do whatever you want. Now, what did Lyndon Johnson do? We had like half a million people over there. We lost 50,000 Americans over there in Vietnam. And it's like, wait, uh, we trusted the president. And remember what Eisenhower said about the military industrial complex? Well, there you go. Stay hydrated, kids. And so, you know, basically, you know, Lyndon Johnson, uh, you know, just gets us involved in Vietnam. And then, you know, Richard Nixon comes in and starts getting us out of that war. Now, then Richard Nixon, uh, which it was the most unnecessary thing because Richard Nixon won a lopsided victory in 1972. But remember the Watergate scandal. And so then you've got a scandal. So it's like, you know, basically our government is getting us involved in these wars. Uh, you know, is involved in scandals and then the economy's not growing. There's a credibility gap. And, you know, you've had all of these changes with civil rights and conservatives start thinking, you know, like, well, maybe we can organize too. And so you have the rise of the conservative movement, which started with Goldwater in 64. Now Goldwater got trounced, but Ronald Reagan in 1980 basically ran on Goldwater's platform and was elected president. <coughs> and you know, basically now the other thing is Reagan was, you know, Reagan was criticizing what he saw as a weak foreign policy. OK, that, you know, the detente policy under Nixon and Ford and Carter, uh, you know, culminating even like the, you know, the Iran hostage crisis where our hostages were in Iran for over a year. Carter tried to rescue them and that messed up. And so there wasn't a great deal of confidence in government. And so Reagan said in his first inaugural address, you know, in in this present uh, in this present crisis, government is not the solution to our problem. Government 
is the problem. Uh, you also might want to note the uh, the moral majority and the religious right under uh, you know the leadership of people like Jerry Falwell. Um, so Jerry Falwell organized uh, you know the this uh, basically evangelical Christians into a voting block. Okay, so part of this Reagan coalition were these uh, you know social conservatives, these religious right conservatives. Um, also remember that you'd had the feminist movement, and you know one thing that, you know, one of the big things that shocked people in the 2016 election is that, you know, the 53% of white women voted for Donald Trump. And a lot of people are like, why are these women voting for Donald Trump? You hear all the things he says about women. Um, but the thing is, a lot of women are conservative. Uh, and so the thing is, they, you know, they're willing to overlook some of those things because they're conservative. Now, the feminist movement, uh, you know, remember Betty Friedan, author of The Feminine Mystique, and, you know, wanting uh, women to have more opportunities uh, in, uh, you know, for employment. Now, remember Roe v. Wade, which, uh, you know, protected abortion rights constitutionally. And so the thing is, though, then Phyllis Schlafly, you know, she sees what's going on and she sees the Equal Rights Amendment which had been passed by Congress and seems pretty non-controversial. Um, but, you know, it just says that, you know, you can't discriminate based on sex. I mean, that seems like something we can all agree on, right? But then Phyllis Schlafly organizes uh, the Eagle Forum, which is a conservative organization, uh, basically an organization largely of, you know, conservative women. And she, you know, organized this campaign to stop the ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment. Why would a woman want to do that? Well, stop. ERA stood for stop taking our privileges. And so, you know, what she told, you know, women and, you know, that's something if you think about it, like, you know, typically I ask, uh, you know, girls in my class. Do you want to sign up for the draft? OK, so when you think about it. If there were a constitutional amendment that said there can be no discrimination based on sex, then that means that not only men can be drafted, but women can be drafted as well. That is a privilege that women have, the privilege not to be drafted. And so the... Uh, you know, so as far as that goes, um, the Equal Rights Amendment was killed by, you know, by the leadership of a conservative woman and an organization of conservative women. Um, and so, uh, yes, thank you so much, uh, Jack Vetter. Oh, wow. Jack Vetter's got Supreme Leader crossed out on his uh, on his Instagram. OK, he really wanted a shout out. I think that's really good here. Um, Schnitzen Gruber is his current Instagram name. Um, but remember, if you just put that on your DBQ or LEQ tomorrow, I just think it'd be funny because the readers will just be like, what is all this with people writing Supreme Leader like on their tests and, you know, become a thing. Like, let's let's just see what we can do. This is the first year in a long time I'm not uh, reading exams, so I don't have any kind of conflict of interest. So I may go ahead and put a tweet out there telling everybody to do that. So make sure that if y'all see that, you retweet it, you tell all your friends, let's make this a thing. I just, I think it'd be funny. And if y'all think it'd be funny, let's do that. But uh, thank you very much, Jack Better. Uh, for supporting that. Tell all your friends about this. All right. So uh, the Warren court decisions, you've got, uh, you know, Brown v. Board is your most important Warren court decision. Uh, now, Elena, I would say that, uh, you know, and typically remember Brown, the, the Warren court tended to favor like civil liberties and uh, that sort of thing and to tend to be more liberal and interventionist and to strike down a lot of things, you know, whereas, uh, you know, after, uh, you know, 1980, the 1980s, the court has become a bit more conservative. All right. So as far as that, go ahead and get some shout outs to me because I'm about to wrap this up. Uh, you know, so if, if you're requesting shout outs, last call for shout outs. I'm going to go through Twitter and I'm going to shout out to classes and teachers and all of that kind of stuff. Wish people luck. Ladies and gentlemen, buy my app, okay, on tomrichie.net slash a push now, or you can just go to the app store, put a push review, APUS history review, Romulus, Romulus, uh, you APUS history review. Now remember, these are not like stimulus based questions. These are just simple questions, putting content in front of you because this is what you're going to need. It's not so much helping you on the multiple choice as helping you on your DBQ, LEQ, SAQs, okay? Because you have to produce specific evidence for these things. So, you know, I think that the app, you know, if you realize what it is and it's just getting content in front of you, you know, knowing the components of Henry Clay's American system and, you know, the positions of the Whig party and stuff like that. And so, you know, going into that, I think it's helpful. It's only uh, $2.99 at the app store. I actually get very little of that. Apple gets 30% and the remaining 70%. 
percent goes to my partner. So I get 30 percent of 70 percent. So it's like I get 30 percent of 70 percent, which is like very little of that. So, you know, when it comes down to it, it's something that, you know, I sell it because there were people who developed this and I spent a lot of my time developing it. But it's not like a huge money maker for me. I developed it because I thought it'd be kind of cool there. You know, the trivia games, people like to do this on their apps. Uh, and so that's why I did this. Now, let me see what we've got as far as shout out requests and stuff like that. Uh, so let's go. All right. Let's see what we've got here. Mr. Anwar's class. OK, Patrick, you got Borat. Uh, great success. Hopefully you make a five tomorrow. All right. So uh, Jake Rubin and Dr. Doug Killa. Um, shout out to the St. Ray's gang. OK, I hope I didn't like shout out like a real gang. But, uh, you know, hopefully it's just kind of like a friend gang or something like that. Right. Um, so, gosh, somebody's be like, why did you shout out to a gang uh, during your uh, your thing here? All right. So then, um, yes. Uh, wait, Nick Gurr. Wait, Nick Gurr's back. I was wondering, like, where is Nick Gurr? Uh, he is back. I have not seen him forever. Um, shout out to actual students. Uh, Logan Durham watching this review. My actual students, my actual students need to go to bed. Uh, you know, so make sure y'all do that because we're getting there. Um, OK, I'm not shouting out to. Um, Let's see. Um, oh, my good. No, I'm not shouting out to Mike Hunt. OK, I'm not doing that. Um, and so uh, shout out for John R. Strutt's class. Um, OK, the Gilded Age. Thank you, Kristen. There you go. Parley parties. Um, let's uh, hit her up with a follow there. All right. Follow back. All right. So let's see what we've got here. Mr. Diwali and Vaughn L O. L Denara. Okay, she thinks that's funny. Uh, Miss uh, Miss Roja, six period. Michelle Rodriguez. Hopefully you do well tomorrow. Hope you do great. Um, Elizabeth McDonald. Now is Elizabeth McDonald in South Carolina? Like, is that actual like Elizabeth McDonald that used to work with me? Is she teaching a push or is it another one? Mister Laffy and Mister Moore from Riverhead, New York. Roman Smith. Always a pleasure. You've been. Uh, I think you might have been supporting my work for a little while. Um, so uh, Barrett, six period class. Okay. Um, yes, I love it. Johnny um, said, Mr. Supreme Leader in, uh, you know, in parentheses. All right. So we've got this, uh, you know, Johnny Douglas, Supreme Leader Vic Nair and Brother Martin High School. Is, is that in Louisiana? I forget because I, I, that sounds familiar. Um, I'm from Louisiana originally. All right. And uh, Mr. Pink. OK, Jocelyn Guile, Mr. Pink's class here. Uh, thank you all so much for doing that. OK, so uh, he'd be so excited. I'm glad to give you a shout out, Jocelyn. Uh, thank you uh, very much for all the kind words. Good luck tomorrow, Mr. Paints class. Um, Mr. Rat, uh, let's see, Rad could, uh, you know, Kristen, whatever your uh, teacher is, um, excellent. It's, it's offering to translate this tweet. Okay. Um, so, uh, yes, Supreme Leader. Cross it out. Okay, very good. I think this is going to be awesome. This will be so lit if y'all actually do this. Um, okay, Lockhart High School, R.L. Turner High School. Students, Miss uh, Miss Dumeris class. Shout out to Miss Hicks class. Uh, Miss May's class in Kalispell, Montana. I'm sending your gratitude. Thank y'all for supporting my work. Um, let's see, Miss uh, Miss Tech Miller's A Push class at DHCA. Mister Mac uh, MacIver Mac MacIver. Um, you know. In Pennsylvania. And let's see, your Supreme Leader, Shentz at Bayport High. Excellent. Ya boy, Ethan. All right. This is this is really like the funnest part when we're doing things. Yeah, this is always a good one. Brooke sent me a meme. Brooke, you sent memes. Brooke, Katie, Taylor, Christina, and Rochelle, you're striving for fives. Okay. And you've got uh you're you've got dank memes to prove it. All right. So let's go ahead and retweet that. I've seen that meme before. It's a pretty funny one. The reconstruction always sunny in Philadelphia. Um, wish I'd started watching Tom Ritchie in September. So I was actually prepared for the exam. That's really funny, Willpower. Uh, and so let's see here. Um yeah, Supreme Leader A Push God, please bless Montgomery High School so you can pass your test some tomorrow. Um, Nick Ham, I will uh, give you a blessing and a follow uh, follow back. Okay, so I give you uh, give you my blessings, Miss Libs B Block. Okay, a dream come true. Thank y'all so much. Uh, yes, uh, Eberhart A Push, the real Supreme Leaders, ladies. And gentlemen. You know, I'm you know I'm not glad Hip Hughes backed out of this, but well, and actually he didn't back out. What happened? 
happen is we review like all the time, like every year. And he just, he, he had some sketch. He was like, did we talk about this? Like I said it out this morning with hip views and he was like, do we talk about this? I was like, I guess not. I just kind of assumed. And you know what happens when you assume, then you have to like invite Kim Jong-un who actually doesn't show up either. And you just have something fun. So anyway, like hip Hughes is to thank for this whole Supreme leader thing. Uh, Miss Ellis, a shout out from Houston. Um, shout out to you because I consider it a blessing. It'll bring me luck tomorrow. I'm the Supreme leader of APUSH, the Supreme leader of APUSH after all. Thank you so much, Col Kalina. That was very, very kind of you. Um, all right. So as far as that, uh, wait, uh, oh, Renee. Oh my goodness. Renee. Renee. Um, yes, I will. I will check Snapchat later. Tom Ritchie SC on Snapchat. If you want to keep up with me on there, Tom Ritchie SC, uh, Mr. Diwali and the Vaughn AP got that, but Tom Ritchie SC on Snapchat at Tom Ritchie on, uh, you know, Twitter and Instagram, of course, but Tom Ritchie SC, please shout out to your Colorado boys, Mr. Swanson's a push class at Lewis Palmer high school, seven Hill school in Cincinnati. That's kind of interesting. Sounds very Roman, the seven Hills. Um, all right. So got to that. And let's see if I can do a few more. Uh, I'm going to do a few more. Sorry, I won't be able to get to all of them. Um, yes. South Elgin High School. Oh, my goodness. I love South Elgin. Uh, will you tell my friend Ethan hello for me? If you will tell, uh, you know, my friend, uh, my friend Ethan hello for me. I think that that will probably raise your AP score um, at least a point. OK, my friend Ethan Culver, OK, who really is one of the greatest young leaders that I know put something together. Um, South Elgin, remember, I think we were trying to put together something for this year and I'd love to come back and see y'all again. I really enjoyed the warm welcome at that school. And uh, Ethan Culver, if you will text him, you know, give him a shout out, anything like that, it's going to help your AP score. But yeah, South Elgin High School, I mean, a special place in my heart for that school. Um, thank y'all, uh, you know, so much. You know, Ethan brought me over there a few a uh, few years ago um, after their teacher passed away. And, uh, you know, that was a real honor and a pleasure to meet Ethan and all of his friends. Okay, so uh, Shafter students, um, your A-Push teacher, Miss uh, Milka Savage. All right, excellent. Uh, you know, you got a good teacher when part of their last name is uh, Savage. Cannon Falls High School wants a blessing. Y'all realize I'm not a priest, right? Um, you know, shout out to Cannon. Canyon High School in Anaheim, Supreme Leader General Morenzada. All right, uh, Miss uh, Mr. Lippman's class. Um, then we've got uh, thank you from a USVI. Carolyn needs sleep. Carolyn, I would suggest that you uh, that you get it. Okay, um, shout them out. Okay, so Mary Caroline, let's see what's going on here. Um, I've got to show a thread. She's making me work for it. Tweet does not exist. Okay, so Mary Caroline, shout out to whoever you wanted me to shout out to, uh, Mr. Mr. Cudgel's class from Muggsy. All right. And so uh, your Gekka Junior class. Um, so that goes that. Now, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you all so much. Now, remember, if you're on the East Coast, get some sleep. OK, um, your Supreme Leader, Mr. Householder at Valencia High. Absolute swole lad. All right. So as far as that goes, ladies and gentlemen, Lancaster Legends, Eberhardt and McCoy, uh, they love me. You know what? I love this. Them. Uh, Vic, shout out to your A push class. Oh my goodness. Uh, you've had a sub this year, Victoria. Um, hopefully y'all do very well. And, uh, you know, I hope your teacher ends up being okay. Um, but ladies and gentlemen, remember one of the best things that you can do is get a good night's sleep. All right. Um, and so your brain's going to be better. You don't want to try to write a DBQ or an LEQ on a limited amount of sleep. So I can't stress that enough. I'm glad that y'all came and reviewed and all that. Um, but really, you need to wind down, do something you enjoy. Now, get away from the phone and the TV and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you know, maybe look at a book or something, you know, um, you know, color, maybe get a coloring book and just cut something that gets you unstressed and ready to go to bed. The best thing you probably do now, not something a push related, like get Harry Potter or something like that and read a little Harry Potter, something that, well, not something too exciting or whatever, but, you know, just calm yourself down, whatever it is, and get your mind off of a push if you're on the East Coast, especially. Now, if you're on the West Coast, you know, it's about that time. Let's, you know, some of us are about to have a fireside chat. I think that's great. But, you know, please, at some point tonight, go to bed, okay? Because you think that now, point of view, somebody who would benefit from you watching all of my videos tonight from like just binge watching and watching the ads of course so i'm telling you something that's really against my 
self-interest because I care about you and I care about this community that we have here. Um, and, you know, remember that I also teach AP Euro. I, I do stuff sometimes for AP government. They're doing the redesign of that curriculum. And also I provide some assistance for uh, AP World History. So, I, and I'm looking to kind of ramp that up a little bit. I've got a Romulus app for it. Um, so remember, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to buy my app tomorrow, you know, don't, you, you know, if you're on the East Coast, use it tomorrow morning when you're on your way to the AP and you're waiting and all that, uh, you know, maybe a good way to kind of just review some content content, but really just take care of yourself. Remember on the multiple choice, especially trust yourself. Okay. Because you don't have anything to lose by trusting yourself. Because if you don't have enough knowledge and skills to like pass this, it's not going to matter. You're going to fail anyway, whether you trust yourself or not. But if you are ready for the exam and you don't trust yourself, you could end up walking yourself into a uh, little failure trap or something like that because you're second guessing yourself. Um, the multiple choice is going to go a lot better if you trust your instincts. Now, don't fall for a sucker answer, but don't sit there like agonizing over this one or this one. One thing about the A push multiple choice, it's typically very easy to eliminate two of them. And then stay hydrated kids and then make sure that you are you know from there that you are um what do you call it um yeah from there pick the best answer make sure you're reading it and all of that kind of stuff um thanks josh rug for or josh uh ruggieri uh for the instagram uh follow there okay thank y'all so much for that all right so ladies and gentlemen just remember do very well and remember if you can throw in a supreme leader somewhere i think it's just going to be a funny little uh you know just kind of gag uh with uh you know with the college board and you know it's just just fun but don't let it distract you from your exam just supreme leader draw a line through it and then just keep going and it'll keep you awake. You'll have fun. The reader will probably think it's kind of funny just to see this uh, joke because it's been several years, I think, since somebody's done like a big, you know, gag like that. Um, but anyway, this has really been an honor and a pleasure. If you're taking one of the subjects I offer support in uh, next year, I hope that you'll uh, that you'll do that. And remember, you know, tell your friends about our little Supreme Leader gag. And I'm going to uh, tweet about that in just a little bit. So look at Twitter and thank you all again so much for coming. And I'm looking forward to uh, my fireside chat with uh, a small group of 30 of my soon to be closest friends. So thank y'all so much. And ladies and gentlemen, especially those of you who've been with me since AP Euro, it means the world to me. Okay. I mean that, you know, if I've been taking you through this for two years, uh, you know, awesome. If you're taking Euro next year, come along with me. But I just, I can't imagine it's like there are over 2000 people still watching and all I've been doing is talking and I'm just, I'm really, really honored by that. And so, you know, and I'm going to be even more honored if, you know, you get a good night's sleep and you do well on this exam tomorrow. And so let me go, let y'all loose to go binge watch videos until it's time to go to bed. Okay. And if you're on the East coast, go get some sleep. All right. Hip Hughes has an exam meditation. Okay. You might want to look at that. Hip Hughes exam meditation. I'll actually tweet that in a second, but I'm going to go now because I got to get ready. I got about seven minutes to get ready for my fireside chat. It's always a pleasure, ladies and gentlemen. Y'all go kill that exam tomorrow.